good to see you. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in Job today, Job chapter 2. And uh, as you turn there, I'm just going to make a little bit of a confession this morning. Uh, And I'm probably not alone, but maybe I am. Have you ever um, gotten something wrong in your life? No. No? (laughs) Have you ever noticed sometimes you can get something right and then later get something wrong? Like even related to the same thing? I know for me as a as a dad, as a pastor, just as a man, as a friend. Sometimes I'll get stuff right, kind of at the beginning, and then a little bit later I'll get something wrong. So it's possible in life to, to get something right and then get something wrong. Today we're going to look at three guys who, who I believe got some things right, who later get some things wrong. So uh, that's kind of where we're going to go today in Job chapter 2. As you're turning there, let me tell you a, a little bit uh, about a very transformative time in my life. Uh, one time, uh, one summer, when I was in college, I had the opportunity to go to Costa Rica and to live in Costa Rica for three months. The purpose of the trip was to get all my Spanish credits for college taken care of and also to do mission work while I was there. It was one of the most transformative times in my life. I, I still have memories from that, even though it was 25 years ago now, that, that are just as clear as the day they happened in my mind. It was the first time I was ever in an earthquake, for example, in Costa Rica. I can still remember the restaurant that we were in. Um, this was before everybody had cell phones, or really before many people had cell phones. Cell phones were around uh, back then, but not like we have them today. That was back in the days when they were just starting to kind of come out. People had bag phones. You remember the bag phones? in your truck with the antenna up on top and everything. That was just kind of kicking off. But even if I would have had a cell phone at that time in my life, I certainly, as a college student, would not have been able to afford the international phone plan for that. In fact, I I couldn't even really afford the long-distance calls to call home. I called home twice the entire summer, and I used a calling card. How many of y'all remember calling cards? Yeah, you got to be a little bit older to remember that. But, uh, I mean, this was back before internet was readily available. When I was down in Costa Rica, I had to go to an internet cafe to check my Hotmail account. And uh, I would check it like once every two weeks, you know. Now I check my my email like once every two minutes these days. For me, at least, this was a time in my life when things moved at a much slower pace. Didn't have a phone attached to me. Didn't have uh, internet with me all the time. Didn't, there was no texting or anything like that. I, I had traveled a little bit growing up, but I had never been outside of the United States at this point in my life. And all of my previous trips had been with family or with FFA or with college ministry. I'd always been with groups of other people that I trusted. But this time I was totally alone. There was nobody I knew going on this trip. My parents dropped me off in San Antonio and I flew to Houston and I got on a Continental Airlines flight from Houston to Costa Rica. I remember right after we took off feeling really alone sitting there in the airplane and and I remember kind of wondering to myself if this was actually a very good idea (laughs) because Coming into San Jose, I didn't know anybody there either. I got there around 9, 9.30 at night, if I remember right. And all I had been told was to get off the airplane, to go collect my luggage, and then just outside the airport where the luggage, the baggage area was, there would be somebody with a a sign with my name on it. And I remember thinking, like, what if they're not there? What if they forget to come get me? Or what if, what if... Like, a bad person is there with my name on it. I get in a van with this strange person I don't know, and they kidnap me and hold me ransom, and my parents don't have any money to pay the ransom. Like, you know, what, what is going to happen to me if, if this all goes wrong? It dawned on me as I collected my luggage that there was a lot that could go wrong this summer, and I was a long way from home. Thankfully, that night, everything went right. I walked outside. There was somebody there with a sign with my name on it. They were my host family. And uh, I got in a car with them. We drove across San Jose. They took me to their house. Their English wasn't very good. My Spanish wasn't very good. So we had very short conversations that first night. They took me upstairs to my bedroom, which was up on the second floor. And um, I 
put my things down and, and laid down to go to sleep. I remember that first night laying there in Costa Rica. My windows were open. They didn't have air conditioning. And I could hear the dogs outside and the street noise. And I would just remember sitting there feeling very, very alone in a strange country, in a strange house, with a strange family, with no way to contact anybody back home, at least not readily, and knowing that I was going to be there for three months. My Spanish classes went from 8 in the morning until 12 at lunch, and I would spend the afternoons doing ministry, uh, mostly in San Jose. And I learned pretty quick early on that, that because I was only going to be there three months, really the only people that were going to listen to me were homeless people. Because, I mean, who was I to talk to anybody else? And so I started doing mostly homeless ministry uh, to people. I would get done with school, and I would walk about a mile to downtown San Jose, and I would minister to, to homeless people as best I could. My first week there, I, I met a man. He was a street artist, very talented guy. He would paint everything with his fingers and his hands, and he would make these elaborate pictures for tourists and people that came by. He was sitting on a mat. He didn't have legs. Both of his legs were gone, and um, his clothes were worn out and tattered. Some of them were just barely hanging on him. His hygiene was awful. Uh, he was super, super skinny, very, very unhealthy, very malnourished. And over time, I began to get to know him. Every day that I would go down there, I would find him in the same place, right around the same area, doing the same thing. And I would stop and talk to him. And eventually those conversations got longer and longer. He actually knew quite a bit of English from all of his interactions with the tourists. And my Spanish got better as the summer went on. And so we were able to have some longer conversations. As I got to know him and got to know more about his story, I was able to really relate with him. And um, I learned that he liked to eat rice and beans and I didn't really like to eat rice and beans, but it was all I could afford at that point in my life. So I ate a lot of rice and beans in Costa Rica. He liked his rice and beans with iglesia sauce. And so a few times a week, I would buy him a plate of rice and beans and me a plate of rice and beans, and I would go and just sit with him. And we would eat together and we would talk together and then tourists would come by and he would do his thing for them and we would just sit together and, and visit. As the summer went on, we became friends we got close, and, and he knew me, and I knew him, and, and we shared some very special conversations together. As I knew my time in Costa Rica was coming to an end, I can distinctly remember thinking that the goodbye that I was least looking forward to was with Miguel. That was his name. I had made a lot of friends that summer at the school. I had interacted with a lot of different people. I'd become very close with my host family. Uh, through those three months. But I knew that I was going to be able to stay in touch with all of them. I, I knew that I could email my host family anytime I wanted. I knew that the friends I had made from New York and New Jersey and Montana and Louisiana and Alabama and even my friends that I had made from Switzerland and Britain through the school, e even those friends, I knew that I could stay in touch with them. And it's crazy to think that over the last 25 years, almost all of us have stayed in touch uh, to some degree or another. In fact, when Abby and I got married, we went to Costa Rica on our honeymoon, and we went and shared a meal with my host family, and I've continued to stay in touch with them to this day. But I knew I would probably never see my friend Miguel again. He was in his late 60s at the time. His health was very poor. He was suffering immensely from his time and his life on the street. And I just had this sense that I would never see him. When Abby and I went back for our honeymoon just a few years later, we looked for Miguel. We walked the streets of San Jose. I went to all the normal spots, and he was nowhere to be found. During my last full day there, I went and grabbed two plates of rice and beans and some iglesia sauce and went and sat with my friend. We finished our lunch, and I shared the gospel with him one more time. And he said, he said, Pedro, you've been faithful to tell me about Jesus, and when I'm ready, I know what to do. I wish there was a real happy story here, and he came to know the Lord, but he didn't. I shared the gospel with him numerous times, and he, he never called on Jesus as his Lord and Savior that I'm aware of. 
But I remember telling Miguel, I, I said, Miguel, I really wish I could do more for you. I wish you didn't have to suffer like this. And he smiled real big. He had a great sense of humor. He smiled real big and he kind of laughed. And he said this, he said, Pedro, everyone suffers in life. But at least the last few months, I've been very thankful that I haven't had to suffer alone. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you for sitting with me. Thank you for hearing my story. We shared a hug. I got up to leave and he said, hey, I made something for you. And out of his bag, he pulled this painting and the paint has faded. It's not near as vibrant as it used to be. And it's hard to see from where y'all are, but he had taken a mirror he had gotten out of the trash and painted with his hands this little thing of Mount Arenal. Something that's very, very special to me. I know it means nothing to y'all, but it's very special to me. I keep it in my closet in a box of a few other things that are incredibly special to me. And it may sound silly, but several times in seasons of deep sorrow and adversity and suffering in my own life, I've gone to that box and I've pulled this painting and several other things out of that box and just been reminded of the encouragement that I found through the relationships that are represented there. Today we're picking up the story in Job chapter 2 verse 11 and we're going to be introduced to three friends of Job and we're going to look at three important lessons that come from this particular interaction with Job. Now I know before all the Bible scholars come out and start emailing me and Twittering me and texting me and saying, but hey, wait a minute, his friends weren't really good friends after all. His friends gave him really bad advice and they end up not helping very much. Let me just say, I know, I get it, I've, I've read the book of Job. In fact, later in this book, Job in chapter 16, for example, he, he has some very harsh things to say to his friends. In chapter 16, verses 2 through 5, he says, I've heard many things like these. You're all miserable comforters. This is what he says to the same people we're talking about today. He says, is there no end to your empty words? What provokes you that you continue testifying? If you were in my place, I could also talk like you. I could string words together against you and shake my head at you. He says, instead, I would encourage you with my mouth, and the consolation from my lips would bring relief to you. I, I get it. His friends fall, end up falling very short in their efforts to help. But in our text today, in the text we're going to look at in chapter 2, I think his friends get three things right, and I think we ought to look at those lessons so we can get those right as we try to be faithful to people in our own lives. And today, the big idea for this message, the whole reason I shared the story about Miguel in the first place is because the big idea really comes from Miguel. The big idea is this, everyone suffers. That's a reality. Everyone is going to suffer in this life, but no one should have to suffer alone. Check this out, Job chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Now, when Job's three friends... Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar heard about all this adversity that had happened to him. Each of them came from his home. They met together to go and sympathize with him and to comfort him. And when they looked from a distance, they could barely recognize him. They wept aloud, and each man tore his robe and threw dust into the air on his head. Then they sat on the ground with him seven days and seven nights. But no one spoke a word to him because they saw that his suffering was very intense. From this text, we can see that these friends are indeed attempting, they're trying to help. They're trying to do the right thing. They've all traveled some distance to be with their friend. They've spent their own time, their own money, their own effort, and their own energy. And their intention is good. The intention in the text says, their intention is that they were going to meet together to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. That's their heart. And that's a great thing for friends to do when someone you know is suffering. So the question is, how can we as God's people, how can we as God's church, how can we as Jesus' disciples be unwaveringly faithful to our Heavenly Father and to our family and to our friends or maybe even to strangers that we're going to meet along our journey? 
The first thing we have to do is this. It sounds simple, but it's hard to do. The first one is this. We have to be able to seek and to see those who suffer. We have to learn to seek them and to see them in their suffering. Last week, our friend, my friend, Tom Clinton was here. He's the leader of First Love International. Y'all got to hear some of his story and some of what they do. It's a great thing that our church is able to partner with them. They're back there on our our mission wall, and and we just love the great work that they do. But if you were here and you got to hear Tom's heart and hear his message, or if you were privileged to be one of the smaller groups that got to go have dinner with them and and just visit with them, I believe you, you can really see that God has blessed Tom with a very unique and very responsive heart to those who suffer. We, we see that unique gifting in certain people. I believe we see that unique gifting in our associate pastor, Scotty Smith, right? He just has a heart that says when people are suffering, he wants to run to that. He wants to help in that. I, I see that same heart in our media director, Jeremiah. He, I know he's a little bit new to our church, but he has that same kind of heart as Tom and as a Scotty. And it's a unique thing. And I'm not saying that the way God has gifted them or the way God has shaped their hearts is any greater than the way he's shaped mine or shaped yours. But, but I think we can recognize not all of us respond in the ways they do when we see suffering. I see that heart in some of you, but the reality is for most of us with other kinds of gifts and, and other things that God has blessed us with, our heart thinks a little different and feels different, and we're not always as quick to seek and see those who are in their suffering. In fact, I think the majority of people are not like Tom and Scotty and Jeremiah. It's not that we don't want to help, and it's not that we don't care about people who are hurting. It's just not our first and primary instinct. For most people, when we see suffering, we tend to shy away from it. Or maybe we even run away from it. Sometimes we see suffering and and we turn away from it. Because it's hard for us to see and we just don't want to see it anymore. For the most part, most people, when they see suffering, they want to stay away from suffering. They don't want to bring it into their life. They don't want to be a part of it. And I'm not saying that in judgment. I'm just saying that as a general observation about how most of us respond to those who are suffering. So the first thing we have to learn how to do is is see people who are suffering and seek them out. Seek them and see them. If we don't, we're going to have a really, really hard time living out our calling as disciples of Jesus. James says in James chapter 1, verse 27, he says, Pure, undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, in their suffering and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, those aren't the only two ways to seek and see people who are suffering. It's not just orphans and widows who are in distress or who are suffering. This is just an example of one way this can look or one thing this can be. And before you say, well, I don't know, when people are suffering, it's just not really that important to me, or before you say, well, most people who are suffering bring it upon themselves, Or before you say in your head, God helps those who help themselves, or something like that, I want you to hear what Jesus says in Matthew 25. And I'm going to read a long portion of text here, because I want you to hear the context of it. And I I want you to hear these words of Jesus, because they're powerful. He says this, starting in verse 31 of Matthew 25, it says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from the other, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, the sheep, he will say, Come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. These are all people in distress, all people who are suffering. And then verse 37, Then the righteous will answer him, 
Lord, when, would, when did we see you hungry? And when did we feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison? When did we visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And then he will also say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't take me in. I was naked, and you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you didn't take care of me. And then they too will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or without clothes or sick or in prison and not help you? And then he will answer them, verse 45, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. See, this text makes us really have to deal with this idea of suffering because the reality is everyone suffers. Suffering is all around us. But it makes us really have to deal with it here because in this text, Jesus is suggesting that if your heart is not willing, not willing to seek and see those who suffer, if your heart is one that turns away, shies away, runs away, and is unwilling to do anything about it, then your heart has likely not been transformed by the gospel. He, he's not saying you earn your way into heaven by doing good works. He's not saying you do good things to get into heaven. He's just saying, hey, if you're a part of the kingdom, if you're one of my children, your heart is going to be for people who are suffering. Your heart is going to be for people who are in need and who are in trouble. So we've got to learn to seek and see these people. You see, the sheep of the shepherd's kingdom are people who seek and see and serve those who are suffering. And on this point, Job's friends actually get it right. At least here in Job chapter 2, they do. Look at verse 11. Now, when Job's three friends... Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar heard about all this adversity that had happened to him. Each of them came from his home. They met together to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. I'm not going to take time here to unpack the geography and the distances these guys had to travel to seek and to see their friend Job. But let me just say, it wasn't just around the corner. This isn't across the street. This isn't one town over. Every single one of them came from over 100 miles away. Good for them. That's a long way to go when you don't have a car. That's a long way to go when you don't have an airplane. That's a long way to go when you're going on foot. Good for them for hearing about their friend's suffering and choosing to do something about it. Good for them for going to see him. Good for them for seeking him out. The challenge for us this week, or maybe I should say the question for us this week, is who do we need to seek out? Who do we need to see? You may not have somebody that pops into your head immediately, but I promise you suffering is everywhere. It's all around us. And if you will open your eyes and open your heart and open your mind, I bet the Lord is going to show you somebody this week that you could bless in some way and help in some way. There is somebody near you that's suffering. There are people in this church sitting near you right now that are suffering. Everyone suffers, but no one should have to suffer alone. Here's the the second thing we see, the second thing we need to learn. After seeking and seeing, we need to learn how to share in the struggle of those who are suffering. We have to learn how to share in the struggle. We're not going to be able to take the struggle away. I wasn't able to fix Miguel's struggle, struggle, but I was able to sit with him and be a part of it and let him know that I saw him and I valued him. I was able to share in some small way in his struggle. When Job's three friends arrived, they find an absolutely shocking sight. Their friend, Job, who if you go back and look at verse 3, for example, of, uh, in chapter 1, it, it says of Job that he was the greatest man among all the people of the East. 
The Job they knew, the, the Job they had last been in the presence of, the Job they had last encountered was a Job who was rich. He was a man who was influential. He was a man that at the city gate everybody listened to. He was a man that was respected. He was a man that had the large family. He was a man that had a large business. He was the man that had it all together. But when they finally get to Job, because some time has passed in all of this, when they finally get to Job, he's in the ashes scraping himself with broken pottery. And his life is wrecked. He has been crushed. He's literally in ruins. We don't know how much time, but we do know some amount of time has passed. I mean, these guys had to first hear about the suffering of Job. There's no cell phone. There's no internet. There's no social media. Word had to travel to them hundreds of miles away to tell them about the plight of their friend. Then they had to make preparations for the trip. They had to get things in order in their own households and in their own way to make the preparations to go. Then they had to plan and, you know, it says they planned to meet together, right? There was some preparation and all of that. And then they had to take the journey to get to where Job was. We don't know how long all of that took, but some time has gone on. And when they finally get there, it says in the text they can't even, they don't even recognize him. It says they hardly recognized him. They're shocked at the condition They find this man in. Look at verse 12. When they looked from a distance, they could barely recognize him. And it says they do three things. They wept aloud. Each one of the three friends tore his robe. And they all threw dust in the air on their head. This shocking, overwhelming sight of this man, the greatest man in the East, this man who had it all together, who's now been crushed, and is sitting in the ashes, caused them to weep, tear their robes, and throw dust into the air onto their heads. The thing about all three of those things that they did is all three of those are a sign of mourning in Job's day. Basically, when they looked at Job, they saw a man who was as good as dead. And so they began to mourn him because they know or they feel that he's as good as dead. He's on his deathbed from from the looks of it. So the only thing they know to do is to mourn. One commentator noted, and I thought this was a a great point, they noted that these three friends did the exact three things that Job himself had done. Job raised his voice to the Lord when he lost everything and, and when he was crushed. So did they in their weeping. Job tore his robes when he heard about his children and their death. So did they when they saw their friend. And Job has covered himself in ashes as a sign of repentance and mourning and desperation. And so do they, symbolically with dirt on their heads and on themselves. It's their way of saying, Job, we grieve with you and we mourn for you. It's also a way of them saying, we're entering into this suffering with you. They couldn't take Job's suffering away. They couldn't bring his children back. They couldn't replace all of his livestock. They they, they couldn't heal his sores or his body. They couldn't fix it. But they said, we're going to, as your friends, enter into this as best we can with you and let you know we're here. They shared in his struggle as best they could. They sympathized with Job. They can't take his pain They can't cure his body. They can't even empathize with him because they've never been through something like this themselves. But they are able to sympathize with him and to share in his struggle in some small way. I think it's important to note here that Job himself had been this kind of person. It says throughout the book of Job in various places that Job was the kind of person who sympathized with and shared in the struggles and the pains of others, orphans and widows and other people who were down on their luck. I won't read all the verses to you, but one is in Job chapter 30, verse 25, where Job says, Have I not wept for those who have fallen on hard times? Has my soul not grieved for the needy? In other words, Job had been the kind of person who attempted to share in the sufferings of other people himself as best he could. Church, this is what friends do. 
This is what caring people do. This is what disciples of Jesus Christ are supposed to do. We see this principle throughout the New Testament in various ways. Again, we're not going to read all the verses, but for the sake of time, we'll just look at Romans 12. In Romans 12, 12, it says this, Rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, be persistent in prayer, share with the saints in their needs, pursue hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. And then look at verse 15. He says, Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. When they're throwing dust on themselves and ripping their clothes and crying out and wailing and weeping, they are, they are associating with Job there in the ashes. They're weeping with one who's weeping. We're called to do this. We're called to live like this. We're supposed to weep with those who weep. And there's not one singular way to do this because everyone suffers and everyone suffers differently. We don't all suffer in the same ways. And so every situation of suffering is going to require a different and unique response. But the point is overall that we as disciples of Christ are called to be there for people and should stand or sit or meet people wherever they are when they're facing adversity. We can't necessarily enter directly into it. We can't always solve their problems for people that are suffering. But we should do our best to sympathize with and to share in the suffering of others as best we can. Everyone suffers, but no one should have to suffer alone. I think Job's friends got that part right. There's a third thing they get right. They sit in silence. For the most part, people don't like silence, but Job's friends, they show up and they see this shocking sight of Job. They can't even recognize the man, and they just sit in silence for seven days and seven nights. This is also, by the way, a sign of mourning Um, in Job's culture, in the Old Testament culture. When somebody was on their deathbed, the, the etiquette, the unwritten rule was you didn't speak to them unless they spoke to you. So for seven days, these three men sit with their friend who does not speak to them, and so they don't speak either. They just sit in silence. Can you imagine how awkward that was? Seven days. Most of y'all couldn't sit in silence for seven minutes. I don't know that I could. Silence is awkward. Silence is weird. Especially when somebody is suffering. But sometimes the absolute best thing you can do is just keep your mouth shut and just be there. Just sit in silence. Especially when somebody is suffering or hurting or in a time of great adversity or need. They don't always need your advice. If they would have kept their mouth shut for the rest of the book, this would be a much shorter book. (laughs) They get it right. They just stay quiet. Sometimes saying nothing is better than saying anything. I can't tell you how many times I've seen this play out in the most awful ways. I had some examples I was going to share with you guys, but as y'all know, I've been here for 21 years now, and so most of my stories involve y'all. And um, I didn't want to throw anybody under the bus. I didn't want anybody to think, oh, he's telling a story about me. Because I, I really believe that that even in the examples I have, and even later on with Job's friends, I really believe people are trying to help. They, they really do. They have a good heart. But sometimes when somebody is suffering and they're in the midst of their suffering and we're uncomfortable with silence and the silence is awkward, we just blurt stuff out. And when you do that, sometimes you say things that are not particularly helpful and sometimes they can be downright hurtful. But here they get it right. Verse 13, Then they sat on the ground with him seven days and nights, but no one spoke a word to him because they saw that his suffering was very intense. For seven days they sat on the ground with him in silence. Now these friends, it's, it's agreed, they're, they're rich people too. These are nobles. 
They humble themselves and sit on the ground with their friend. These are important men. And here they are sitting on the ground covered in dirt and dust with their robes ripped open in the midst of their weeping and they just sit there in silence. They get it right. Good for them. Proverbs 17, 17, I believe is a great verse. A friend loves at all times, it says, and a brother is born for a difficult time. Some translations say for adversity. I've had friends like that in my life. You probably have as well. Friends that came in in your suffering and friends that came in in your adversity. I've done my best and you probably have as well to be a friend like that for others. But you know what? Sometimes being a friend to another person who's in the middle of suffering just requires you to shut up and be quiet. Everyone suffers, but no one should have to suffer alone. And don't make their suffering worse by saying something that God doesn't want you to say. Don't, don't say something just because you don't want it to be quiet anymore. You don't always have to use words to let people know that you're there. Sometimes just being there is enough. Church, there's suffering all around us. Some of it's external. Some of it we can see. My friend Miguel in Costa Rica, his suffering, a lot of it was external, but he had a lot of the other kind of suffering too. And that's an internal suffering. That's the suffering we can't see. That's the suffering that doesn't show up on the surface. That's the suffering that's not easily identifiable. It's the kind of suffering that we need the help of the Holy Spirit to be able to sense it because we can't see it with our eyes. But I promise you it's there. It's all over our community. It's where you work. It's there when your kids are playing on the the recreation fields, the sports fields, at the baseball fields, at the football games. It's there. It's right here inside this building right now. It's there. I promise you it's there because everyone suffers. Unfortunately, that's a reality of life. Our suffering is not all the same, but we all suffer at some point in some way. Jesus, he told his disciples in John 16, 33, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And then he said, you will have suffering in this world. Be courageous, I have conquered the world. Everyone suffers, but no one should suffer alone. I want to close with this. I want you to know this. Even if no friend or no Christian or no good-meaning person comes into your life, maybe because your suffering is internal and they can't see it, or maybe it's external and there's just nobody around that won't shy away, turn away, run away, or stay away from it. Can I just tell you this? If Jesus is the Lord and Savior of your life, if if Jesus is the King of your life, if Jesus is inside of you and in your life, you will never suffer alone. I want you to think about this for just a second. Think about who Jesus was and why he came. The Bible tells us very clearly why Jesus came. It says he came to do what? He came to seek the lost. He saw us where we were. God saw us where we were in our sin, separated from him. And he said, I'm going to send my son to seek you. Luke 19.10, for the son of man, Jesus, has come to seek and save the lost. That's why he came. Jesus shares in our struggles. He knows what it is. He never sinned. But he was tempted in every way. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But instead we have one who has been tempted in every way. Just as we are, yet was without sin. Therefore, it says, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. He knows what suffering is. He knows what struggle looks like. He knows where you're at. And finally, keep this in mind, Jesus has been pursuing you 
all the days of your life. He's been present and pursuing you all the days of your life, even though it's largely been in silence. The Lord's not going to force himself upon you. He's not going to tackle you to the ground and wrestle you into submission until you'll do what he wants and come into your life. An act of repentance is a decision you make in your life to make him the king and the Lord of your life. But he's never left you. He's never abandoned you and he never will. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord does not delay in his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. He's there, patiently waiting for you to come to repentance, waiting for you to say yes, waiting for you to call on him. If you've never done that, I pray you would do it today. It's not going to solve all your suffering. It's not going to fix all your problems. But it will mean you will never, ever, ever suffer alone. Jesus is the answer to all suffering because he is the answer to sin. And sin is from where all suffering ultimately originates and comes. If you never want to suffer alone, give your life to Jesus And for those of us who are believers and who call Jesus our King and our Lord, we should be the kind of friends that we see here at least in the initial stages of Job's journey through suffering. Let's pray. If you've never given your life to Christ, we invite you to do so this hour, this day, not by coming to the front, not by raising your hand or standing up, but just by asking the Lord to come into your life. If that's you, we invite you to pray with us in the stillness of your heart. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out. Lord, I ask by faith that you would make me new. In faith, I repent of my sins and give my life to you. Thank you for your grace and for your goodness, for your love and for your mercy. Lord, as we close this hour, we are grateful for who you are, for what you've done. Father, grateful that you forgive us when we fall short. Whether that's falling short in some area of our life and our relationship with you or Lord, whether that's falling short as friends and disciples to those around us who are struggling, Lord, I pray that you would indeed give us eyes, ears, and a heart to seek and to see and to be willing to serve those who are suffering around us. Lord, help us to honor you this week, wherever we go and whatever we do, by just doing what we can for those who are hurting. Lord, I know so many times we don't do anything at all because we don't feel like whatever we're going to do is going to make a difference. But Lord, even a small plate of rice and beans and a little bit of sauce and a little bit of time can make a huge difference in somebody's day. And even in their life and perhaps even in their eternity. Help us to never forget that. Help us to never forget that all we can do is the little part we do that day and you'll do the rest. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We ask your blessing on us all now. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks so much for being a part of our online family and joining us for this message that God put on my heart. I pray that it blesses you. I want to ask you if you could just do three quick, simple, easy, free things for me right away. If you haven't already, number one, hit the subscribe button. Number two, hit the thumbs up or like button if you feel like this video, this sermon is worthy of that. And number three, if God blesses your heart with this message, leave an encouraging word. Just leave an encouraging comment or a thought down there in the comment section. We would appreciate that so much. Thank you for being a part of our family, for joining us uh, here for this message.